Housing and Urban Affairs will come to order. Uh, welcome our witnesses. Today's hearing is in a hybrid format. Our witnesses, one is virtual, three are in person. Members have the option to appear either in person or virtually. For those joining remotely, a few reminders. Uh, members already know how to do this after many times. Um, for our remote witness, just please try to minimize background noise. Click the mute button until it's your turn to speak. Uh, you'll have one box on your screen labeled clock that will show how much time of your five minutes is remaining or the questioner's five minutes. Uh, you'll hear a bell ring when you have 30 seconds remaining. If there's a technology problem, we'll move on to the next witness or senator. Uh, the speaking order is, as usual, determined by seniority of the members who have checked in before the gavel, either in person or uh, remote. And then we go back and forth, Republican, Democrat, Republican, Democrat. A few years ago, most people had never heard of cryptocurrency. Most people still didn't know what all these terms mean from stable coins to non-fungible tokens. But they've become a hot topic in Washington, on Wall Street, online, among millions of Americans who understandably just don't trust big banks and are looking always for an opportunity to make money. Over the last several years, the number of cryptocurrencies has exploded from the hundreds to the thousands. The supposed value of these digital assets in circulation recently passed $3 trillion, which is about the size of J.P. Morgan Chase's balance sheet, our, largest, large, our nation's largest bank. With that much money tied up, that's pretty much the definition of a systemic issue in our economy. Those big numbers have come with big promises. We've been told that blockchain, the technology these coins are built upon, will democratize money or build a more inclusive economy. But none of these promises has materialized, likely never will. Instead, we've gotten wild financial speculation. As we've heard before in this committee, the wild price swings and high transaction fees for many cryptocurrencies make them useless for payments, the one thing they claim to be designed for. Stable coins were supposed to solve this problem. Unlike other cryptocurrencies, their value isn't just based on market enthusiasm. A stable coin's value is supposed to be backed by real assets held by the company that issues the stable coin. In other words, stable coins are a particular type of cryptocurrency whose value is managed by a single company. These include, as you know, Tether, Circle, and Abracadabra, a fast-growing scheme that makes magic internet money. That, that's their words, not mine. What could possibly go wrong with something that claims to make magic money? Cryptocurrency advocates argue that crypto assets are superior to real dollars because they're decentralized and transparent, and transparent but st stable coins are neither of those. Most of them, certainly the largest ones, rely on a single centralized company to manage the reserves a reserve assets and their supply of coins. That sounds a lot like what traditional financial institutions do. It's not decentralized when one company controls when people can access their own money. It's certainly not transparent when critical information about stable coins and the companies that issue them aren't available to people who have their money tied up in those assets. Last month, I wrote to some of the biggest stable coin issuers to get more information on how they manage their funds that back their coins and, and to ask what rights that their users have. The responses were not particularly enlightening. They should lead us to us and should lead us to assume most ordinary customers don't have much in the way of rights at all. So let's be clear about one thing. If you put your money in stable coins, there's no guarantee you're going to get it back. They call it a currency, implying it's the same as having dollars in the bank, and you can draw the money at, at any time. But many of these companies hide their terms and conditions, allowing them in the fine print, allowing them to trap customers' money. There's no guarantee you'll get your money back. That's not a currency with a fixed value, it's gambling. And with this much money tied up, it sure looks to me like a potential asset bubble. Stable coins make it easier than ever to risk real dollars on cryptocurrencies that are at, least, that are at best volatile, at worst outright fraudulent. Just a few weeks ago, we saw how quickly these tokens can crash with crypto markets diving by almost 30% in one day. History tells us we should be concerned when any, invest, any investment becomes so untethered from reality. Look at the 1929 stock market crash. Security started out as a way for regular Americans to invest in new companies that wanted to bring new products to market to expand their operations. By the end of the decade, companies 
were invented out of thin air to create more stocks to satisfy wild demand. Banks allowed customers to borrow against one stock to buy another until the whole market collapsed. And of course, many of us are old enough to remember, most of us are, the 2008 crash. Subprime mortgages were supposed to create, to give more families access to the American dream, while derivatives were created to help financial companies reduce their risks. In reality, predatory mortgages were used to strip homeowners of their equity, the, the, the equity they had in their homes in order to create complex mortgage-backed securities and derivatives that ended up increasing risks at banks and financial companies. We know how that turned out for our country. We can't deny that betting on cryptocurrency has made a few people rich. That kind of action always does. Just like some people became fabulously wealthy trading stocks in the 1920s or buying and selling derivatives 20 years ago. And we heard the stories about mortgage brokers and house flippers becoming millionaires more recently. But for most people, this kind of wild speculation ends in disaster. The only ones who tend to walk away unscathed are the big guys. It's always the big guys, the ones who call it innovation and then line their own pockets. So far, what happens in the crypto markets has stayed in the crypto markets so far. But stable coins create a very real link between the real economy and this new fantasy economy. We saw this with Doja coins, a satirical cryptocurrency that was all of a sudden worth billions when a tech billionaire tweeted about it. Think about that. It's understandable a lot of people are looking for an alternative to our current financial system. Wall Street banks dominate this economy. They make record profits no matter what happens to workers in small businesses and in Nevada and South Dakota and Ohio and Rhode Island. To a whole lot of people, that seems like a fantasy economy too. But a big tech scheme that makes it easy for hardworking Americans to put their money at risk isn't the answer. Stable coins, crystal, crypto markets aren't actually an alternative to our banking system. They're a mirror of the same broken system with even less accountability and no rules at all. We'll hear the same arguments today from this industry against regulation, the same arguments we hear from the financial industry lobbyists so many times before. It harms innovation. The free market will solve all our problems. America needs to be globally competitive. Of course we do. What makes America, though, the strongest economy in the world isn't wild betting in the financial sector. It's our workers. It's, the dign it's our workers. It's the dignity of work. It's their talent. It's their ingenuity, their dedication. That's what our economy is built on. You can't fake that. But as we've seen so many times before, you can put it all at risk. The, te the, the rest of the world trusts the U.S. dollar when we have orderly sane markets. The real threat to our global competitiveness is regulators who ignore clear warning signs. We have reason to be encouraged this time around, though. The Biden administration is putting strong watchdogs in place, quite a change, strong watchdogs in place at the banking and market, as, as banking and market regulators. We're empowering workers, wages are rising, infrastructure investment is about to spur more job growth. We're fighting to bring down costs for, for families, for seniors with prescription drugs, uh, for, for, uh, for the middle class with the Build Back Better plan. We can't put that potential at risk. I'll continue to work with the financial watchdogs to ensure they have the tools they need to protect people's hard-earned money in our economic recovery from another, another bubble and another crash. Uh, Senator Toomey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Stable coins are a central component of the cryptocurrency ecosystem, which is itself at the vanguard of the tokenization of assets. Stable coins can speed up payments, especially cross-border transfers. They can reduce costs, including remittance, rem remittances. And, and they can help combat money laundering and terrorist financing through an immutable and transparent transaction record. Stable coins can also be programmed and made interoperable with other currencies, creating efficiencies to improve access to financial services for more Americans. But unlike volatile cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, stable coins don't fluctuate in their dollar price. In today's hearing, we'll focus on stable coins designed to maintain a one-to-one -one value relative to the U.S. dollar, meaning one stablecoin is meant to always equal $1. Over the past year, the stablecoin market has exploded. As one of our witnesses, Dante Desparte, will explain, stablecoins are beginning to be used for small business payments and international remittances. While traditional payment systems can be expensive and take several days to settle, transferring funds via stablecoins is low cost and nearly instantaneous. Given that stablecoins disrupt the status quo, They've naturally drawn skepticism from incumbent industries and regulators. 
Last month, the President's Working Group on Financial Markets, or PWG, issued a report recommending that Congress pass legislation to establish a federal regulatory framework for stablecoins. In their report, the Treasury Department and others expressed their worries about consumer protection and financial stability with stablecoins. Although the report did little to highlight the potential benefits of stablecoins, I was encouraged that the report acknowledged that responsibility for clarifying whether and to what extent federal agencies has jur- have jurisdictions over stablecoins is a question that rests with Congress. I'm open to working with the administration and my Democratic colleagues on this front, but whatever Congress does, let's be sure that we don't stifle innovation in an evolving digital economy or undermine our own country's competitiveness. Let's have the humility to recognize that many of our views about how financial services are delivered and how investment work vis- investments work are quickly becoming outdated. This morning, I'm releasing a set of guiding principles that I think should influence our work on a stablecoin legislative framework. These principles recognize that stablecoins are a very important innovation, and they introduce new capabilities into money that did not previously exist. In addition to their ease of use and reduced fees associated with their transfer, stablecoins can improve the privacy and the security of our transactions. They also introduce the concept of money programmability, or smart contracts, which allow automated transactions based on a sequence of verifiable events. In recognition of the potential of these new capabilities, any regulation should be narrowly tailored and designed to do no harm. At the same time, sensible regulatory standards may help to protect against key risks, such as redemption or run risk. These principles take a different approach than the PWG report. For example, the PWG report recommends that all stablecoin issuers must be insured depository institutions. Well, there are three reasons that I disagree with that recommendation. First, stablecoin issuers have different business models than banks. They do not provide the same services as banks and do not present the same risks. As one of today's witnesses, Ms. Mazzari, has observed, stablecoin providers do not engage in taking deposits and making loans in the manner that banks do. Because of these and other important differences, subjecting all stablecoin providers to the full suite of bank regulations and rules meant to address maturity transformation is not appropriately tailored to the potential risks. Second, requiring all stablecoin issuers to become banks would stifle innovation. We know that a tremendous amount of innovation occurs outside of the banking system, including by technology companies. It's unlikely that much of this development could happen within the banking system because of the onerous regulations which create a difficult environment for innovation. Allowing entrepreneurs to innovate with digital assets like stablecoins will promote greater competition and deliver better results for consumers. Finally, the regulation of payments activities should create an equal playing field. Great innovators like (coughs) PayPal, Venmo, and Apple Pay are already subject to a state-by-state licensing regime, as well as registration with the federal regulator. Recognizing the range of different business models, there should be at least three options available for a stablecoin provider. One would be to operate under a conventional bank charter if they chose. But two, they could comply with or acquire a special purpose banking charter designed for stablecoin providers, which would be designed in accordance with legislation, or... They could register as a money transmitter under the existing state regime and as a money service business with FinCEN at the federal level. This optionality would match each stablecoin provider with the regulatory framework most appropriate to the business model. Regardless of the charter or license they pursue, all stablecoin providers should meet certain minimum requirements. For example, they should clearly disclose what assets back the stablecoin, as well as give clear redemption policies and subject themselves to periodic audits. These requirements would ensure that consumers have sufficient information about which stable coins they use. It might also be appropriate to set minimum reserve requirements and attestations as well. In addition, legislation should stipulate that non-interest-bearing stable coins are not necessarily securities and therefore shouldn't automatically be regulated as such. This framework should protect the privacy, security, and confidentiality of individuals using stable coins, allowing customers to opt out of sharing personal information with third parties. Finally, anti-money laundering and other requirements regarding financial surveillance under the Bank Secrecy Act should really be modernized for all financial institutions subject to them, given the emergence of stable coins, cryptocurrencies, and other new technologies, including artificial intelligence. The emergence of stable coins represents to me the latest development in the ongoing evolution of money. 
I stand ready to work on this issue and do so in a manner that doesn't discourage innovation or competition moving forward. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses, and I yield back my time. Uh, thank you, Senator Toomey. Um, I'll introduce the four witnesses today. First, we'll hear from Alexis Goldstein, Director of Financial Policy at the Open Market Institute. Welcome. Uh, Zai Masari, a partner at Davis Bulk and Wardwell. Uh, welcome. And, uh, Chief Strategy, and, and Chief Strategy Officer and Head of Global Policy at Circle, and Professor uh, uh, Hillary Allen from the American, I'm sorry, Dante Desparte, I left out, I'm sorry, sorry, Chief Strategy Officer and Head of Global Policy at Circle, and Professor Hillary Allen, who is joining us um, from her home or office um, from the American University of Washington College of Law. Uh, Ms. Goldstein, you begin. Five minutes, please. Thank you. Chair Brown, Ranking Member Toomey, and members of the committee, thank you for inviting me to testify today. I'm the Director of Financial Policy at the Open Markets Institute, where my work focuses on financial regulation and consumer and investor protection. My degree is in computer science, and I previously worked as a programmer for Morgan Stanley, building electronic trading systems, and as a business analyst at Merrill Lynch and Deutsche Bank, working with the over-the-counter equity derivatives trading desks. I'm a researcher, but I'm also an investor. I invest in the equity markets, and I invest in the crypto asset markets. I've used large crypto exchanges. I've used DeFi to lend, to borrow, and to trade crypto. And I've bridged from one blockchain to another. In doing so, I've seen how stable coins are used across the crypto ecosystem. And I agree with the Presidential Working Group's assessment that stable coins are used today for speculation. Stable coins essentially act as a way station in between other speculative trades and as a way to avoid losses. Stable coins are often heralded for their potential. Maybe they're not used wildly, widely today to pay for goods and services, but they could be in the future. But the reality is that today, US retail investors across stable, sorry, retail investors access stable coins by trading them, not by using them to buy groceries at the corner store. US retail investors can neither purchase nor redeem the top two stable coins directly from the issuer. Instead, they are reliant on exchanges to trade a stablecoin for a dollar. It's an awkward scenario and a sort of a second step that we're not used to seeing with other kinds of digital payments. You don't need to also set up a stock brokerage account in order to send somebody money electronically. There are a number of ways to earn interest and rewards on stablecoins. Many crypto lending platforms pay far higher rates for locking stablecoins into their platforms than they do for locking in non-stable coins. And Coinbase pays its users a 1% reward for buying and holding the US dollar coin by default without any action from the user other than purchasing USDC. Coinbase does not offer any rate of return for other stable coins, likely because the more USDC that Coinbase holds for its customers' accounts, the more money they'll make in the revenue sharing agreement that they have with Circle. There are claims in the cryptocurrency industry and among some stable coin issuers that they're fighting Wall Street or disrupting Wall Street. But they use the same forced arbitration agreements and class action bans that Wall Street does, preventing their users from suing in a court of law should things go wrong. There are also claims that regulations and government oversight aren't needed because the code is up there publicly available for anybody to read. But the moment a platform is hacked because an attacker has read the smart contract, found a bug, and exploited the bug, platforms tend to call for law enforcement to help chase down the stolen funds. There are also promises that stablecoins could help drive financial inclusion outcomes, an admirable goal I think we can all agree is critical. A recent report from the World Economic Forum found that stablecoins have no benefit for financial inclusion as they are subject to the same or higher barriers as pre-existing financial options, including the need for internet and for smartphones. I have also found this to be true as I have used stablecoins as fees begin to add up fast, especially when you want to send your stablecoin to your friend or to a different wallet off of the exchange. The slice of the cryptocurrency markets with the least compliance with regulations, including checks for illicit finance, is what is called DeFi or decentralized finance. Put simply, DeFi doesn't work without stablecoins. Stablecoins help to facilitate trading on decentralized exchanges and acts as collateral in lending and borrowing protocols. The largest decentralized exchange is Uniswap, and as of yesterday, eight out of nine of the top liquidity pools in Uniswap had at least one leg in a stablecoin. 
With only a few exceptions, the platforms on DeFi are not in compliance with Know Your Customer, anti-money laundering, and countering the financing of terrorism. Nor does it seem that many of them are conducting a simple check to ensure that the cryptocurrency address making calls to the protocol are not on the sanctions list. Today, the cryptocurrency market is not that entangled with the mainstream financial system. But if Wall Street and the cryptocurrency industry have their way, it will be. I think the committee is right to pay attention to stablecoins and crypto asset markets more broadly, because absent your attention, I do think that there is potential for crises, especially in the least regulated pieces of the ecosystem. Thank you very much, and I look forward to your questions. Uh, thank you, Ms. Goldstein. Uh, Ms. Mazzari. Chairman Brown, Ranking Member Toomey, and members of the committee, thank you for inviting me here today to talk about this complex and interesting topic. I'm Zayi Masari, a partner in the Financial Institutions Group at Davis Polk. For the past several years, I've been advising stablecoin issuers, digital wallet providers, and financial institutions on the, regulatory, the financial regulatory considerations for stablecoin activities. Today, I'm presenting my own views, not those of any client or my firm. My remarks will focus on three key points. First, stablecoins are an innovation in our understanding of money. This is particularly the case for true or payment stablecoins. These are non-interest-bearing financial instruments designed to main, maintain a stable value against a reference fiat currency say, $1. Today, stablecoins are used primarily for payments in connection with cryptocurrency transactions and decentralized finance, that is, DeFi applications. Stablecoin stable payments, though, could have broader uses, complementing existing payments, such as cash, checks, credit and debit cards, and wire transfers, each of which has benefits and drawbacks. Second, as stablecoins begin to find use in retail payments, we must seek to understand the risks they present along with the benefits. Like the innovations in money that preceded them, stablecoins squarely present the core regulatory concerns of consumer protection, systemic stability, safety and soundness, and combating illicit finance. And as described in the President's Working Group report, stablecoins give rise to more specific kinds of risks, such as those related to, oper to the operation of blockchain uh, platforms and risks arising from regulatory gaps. And third, the regulation of stablecoins should address these risks while supporting their potential benefits. My written statement goes into these points in more detail. But for now, I will summarize my view of what regulation of stablecoins should look like. Stablecoin issuers should have restrictions on permissible types of reserve assets to ensure sh uh, short-term liquid backing of those reserves. They should have auditing and transparency standards so regulators and the public can evaluate reserve composition. There should be restrictions that preclude maturity and liquidity transformation to shield reserve assets. They should have obligations to address illicit finance and sanctions considerations. And there should be requirements to address operational risks from conducting transfers on blockchain networks. But requiring stablecoin issuers to be insured depository institutions, that is, insured banks, as suggested in the PWG report, is not necessary, and unless certain adjustments are made, is not workable. First, FDIC insurance is not necessary to address run risk where a stablecoin issuer properly regulated holds reserves of short-term liquid assets of at least 100% of the par value of outstanding stablecoins. Second, banks are subject to leverage ratios and risk-based capital ratios that assume relatively illiquid and riskier assets than cash and genuine cash equivalents. Unless Congress recalibrates these ratios, the stablecoin business model would be uneconomic. 
Congress should instead consider an optional federal charter for stablecoin issuers. At this time, U.S. stablecoin issuers and digital wallet providers are largely regulated by the states under money transmission regulators and straight state trust company authorities. But an expanded federal role may well be appropriate and useful. I would like to close by thanking the committee for its focus on these important issues. While I do not believe that stablecoin issuers should be required to be insured banks, I strongly support common sense regulation for stablecoins in a way that takes into account their risks and benefits. And I'm optimistic that there is much common ground that can pave the way for a regulatory approach that safeguards consumers, the banking system, and the broader economy while continuing to promote innovation. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Mazzari. Uh, Mr. Disparte, welcome. Chairman Brown, Ranking Member Toomey, members of the Senate Committee on Banking, Housing, and Urban Affairs. Thank you for the opportunity to share my testimony with you today. My name is Dante Disparte, and I'm the Chief Strategy Officer and Head of Global Policy for Circle, a leading digital financial services firm and the sole issuer of USD coin or USDC, a dollar digital currency supporting the extensibility of the US dollar in a competitive, always-on global economy. Having recently completed my three-year term on the Federal Emergency Management Agency's National Advisory Council, and being no stranger to disaster displacement and hardship, I want to acknowledge the communities affected by last week's devastating storms. Indeed, as this disaster and others have shown, with the movement of financial aid and disaster relief, when speed matters most, friction stands in the way. As a country, we have faced a great depression, a great deleveraging, and in 2020, with the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, we face nothing short of a great correction. In this correction, the centrality of technology for any semblance of political, business, economic, and household continuity was laid bare. What was also clear is that access to the internet and other digital public goods was unequal. How we engage with money and payments in digital form was clearly an area of pre-pandemic vulnerability in the US and around the world. The advent of stable coins, or what we like to refer to as dollar digital currencies like USDC, are an important innovation, enabling greater control over how we send, spend, save, and secure our money. To define a stablecoin, noting that like money itself, not all of these innovations are created equal, is tantamount to the moment we converted our compact disks into MP3s. The CD and music is still yours, but now enjoys the powers of programmability, user control, and a digitally native form factor that works anywhere on any device across the planet. Stablecoins, in effect, are designed to reference and import the economic properties of an underlying asset. By circulation, the most successful of which all reference the dollar, with the economic aim of combating the buyer's and spender's remorse that plagued early cryptocurrencies. USDC is a now three-year-old dollar digital currency standing at more than $40 billion in circulation and cumulatively supporting more than $1.4 trillion in on-chain transactions in a manner that enhances financial inclusion, responsible innovation, and integrity. Critically, the dollar-denominated assets backing USDC, which are strictly cash and short-duration treasuries of 90 days or less, are all held in the care, custody, and control of US-regulated financial institutions. Indeed, as this internet-native financial infrastructure continues to grow, we aim to do our part, ensuring the future of payments and money is more inclusive than the past. Our recently announced Circle Impact Initiative has four core, core components, each of which are close to home for me, having grown up in poverty and being the first generation high school and college graduate. These include allocating a share of USDC dollar reserves to minority depository institutions and community banks across the country. We hope this will accrue to billions of dollars over time strengthening the balance sheets of these banks and thereby strengthening their communities. Embarking on digital financial literacy initiatives together with historically black colleges and universities and other partners supporting the development of essential learning and hands-on approaches to entrepreneurialism. Leveraging our Seed Invest platform, which is one of the nation's leading equity crowdfunding businesses to catalyze targeted campaigns for women and minority entrepreneurs across the country. 
And finally, assisting humanitarian interventions and coordinating public-private partnerships to mobilize blockchain-based payments and USDC to deliver corruption-resistant, real-time aid and relief. Because nothing worth doing is worth doing alone, our hope is to catalyze uncommon coalitions on these initiatives, which are deeply connected to our mission of raising global economic prosperity through the frictionless exchange of financial value. While some argue that the US may lose the digital currency space race if it fails to issue a, a central bank digital currency, I argue that we are winning this race because the sum of free market activity taking place inside the US regulatory perimeter with digital currencies and blockchain-based financial services, the sum of these activities are advancing broad US economic competitiveness and national security interest. Thank you, Chairman Brown and Ranking Member Toomey for the opportunity to speak with you today. I look forward to addressing the committee's questions. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Nisbarte. Um, we will now hear from Professor Hillary J. Allen from uh, Washington, American University, Washington College of Law, and she is joining us from a remote location. Professor Allen, welcome. Thank you, Chairman Brown, Ranking Member Toomey, and the members of the committee. Thank you for inviting me to testify at today's hearing. My name is Hillary Allen, and I'm a professor of law at the American University, Washington College of Law, and the author of the book, Driverless Finance, FinTech's Impact on Financial Stability. My area of expertise is financial stability regulation, and so I will focus my remarks today on risks relating to crypto, particularly stable coins, and financial crises. I would also like to point out that while not the primary focus of my testimony, stable co coins pose a threat to monetary policy as well, and I would be happy to take questions on that point. Proponents of crypto often claim that it creates jobs and that it improves financial inclusion. But financial crises destroy jobs, and they disproportionately affect the most vulnerable members of our community, and so we should be extremely wary of the fragilities that crypto could create for our financial system. Crypto technology introduces a number of new fragilities, including the ability for anyone with programming ability to create financial assets out of thin air, and more assets mean bigger bubbles and bigger busts. The distributed ledgers that crypto run on often have very compl complicated governance mechanisms, which make fixing problems caused by glitches and hacks extremely challenging. Fragilities also arise because the computer programs that operate on distributed ledgers, known as smart contracts, execute automatically, even when the parties agree that forbearance is in their best interests and the interests of financial stability. Other fragilities include the possibility of runs on stable coins if holders lose confidence in their ability to exchange stable coins for fiat currency at the expected rate. An important point to note about stable coins, though, is that although it's hard to obtain concrete data on the crypto markets, my understanding is that stable coins are almost exclusively being used in DeFi apps rather than for everyday payments. DeFi stands for decentralized finance, but DeFi is not particularly decentralized. Centralized governance and concentrated ownership um, proliferate in the DeFi ecosystem. Instead, what distinguishes DeFi from the established financial system is the technology that it relies upon, which I've already discussed, and what it is used for. Our established financial system performs the important functions of channeling capital to people and businesses so that our economy can grow. That is why we have safety nets for the financial industry, like deposit insurance and finance, Federal Reserve emergency loans that ensure that credit can keep flowing to the real economy. It becomes problematic, though, when the financial services being bailed out do not serve the real economy, but exist primarily to make profits for industry leaders. This is already an issue in the established financial system, and DeFi has the potential to take this to the extreme. DeFi has been described as an incorporeal casino, and that's why it's critical that DeFi not grow into something that the government does feel compelled to bail out. A recent report from the Bank for International Settlements concluded that given its self-contained nature, the potential for DeFi-driven um, disruptions in the broader financial system and the real economy seems limited for now. But allowing the integration of DeFi with the traditional banking system could change that. Congress or banking regulators should therefore prohibit insured depository institutions and their affiliates from participating in DeFi. Ensuring the issuers of the stable coins that fuel DeFi would also encourage its growth and systemic importance. And so I disagree with the President's Working Group recommendation that Congress adopt legislation regulating stable coin issuers as insured depository institutions. The run risks with the stable, sorry, associated with stable coins can be dealt with in other ways. One possibility is to ban stable coins or to introduce a licensing regime that would only authorize the issuance of stable coins if they can demonstrate a purpose outside of the DeFi ecosystem 
uh, and that they do not pose any obvious threats to financial stability or monetary policy. A ban or licensing regime would create some barriers to innovation, to be sure, but not all financial innovation is created equal. A recent World Economic Forum white paper concluded that stablecoins are current, as currently deployed would not provide compelling new benefits for financial inclusion beyond those offered by pre-existing options. Simpler mobile payments innovations may be a better and less risky way to promote financial inclusion than a system built on runnable stable coins that operate on a distributed ledger with a convoluted governance structure that entails significant environmental costs to operate. An alternative approach would be for stable coins to remain regulated as they are currently, with the SEC and CFTC monitoring them from an investor protection perspective. The systemic risks associated with stable coins and runs could be addressed by first prohibiting insured deposit taking institutions from accepting any deposits from stable coin issuers or from issuing their own stable coins. Second, the FSOC and the OFR monitoring the stable coins for changes in usage. Third, if necessary, the FSOC using its designation powers to designate a stable coin is systemically important. And fourth, using antitrust regulation as well as the FSOC's designation power to prevent a large tech firm like Meta or Facebook from launching a stable coin. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Uh, thank you, Professor Allen. Um, I'll begin with Ms. Goldstein. I first just uh, there are there are three votes beginning around eleven o'clock. We think, and so. Um, meaning no disrespect to the four of you, but we will all be moving in and out, but, but keep the hearing going and asking questions. So, uh, Ms. Goldstein, even though, and please be brief on these because there's a lot of material to cover, of course. Stable coins are mostly used for speculative betting. Some crypto advocates argue they have the potential to make the payment system faster and more efficient. Are they a better way to settle payments nationally or internationally than traditional finance systems? Senator, thank you for the question. I think for that to be true, you need four things. You need low fees, you need predictability, you need to be able to exchange them for goods and services, and it needs to be consistently fast. And I don't think stable coins meet all of those needed objectives. As someone who's played around with sending them, um, both personally and sort of in my work, um, it often makes Western Union look cheap when you rack up all of the fees that you need in order to send it from one person to another, especially when the Ethereum blockchain gets congested. Um, it can be very unpredictable. Fees can be very high. And I think, as you know, Senator, you know, people with low incomes can't afford surprises. And unfortunately, transferring assets, especially on the dominant Ethereum blockchain, can be full of a lot of surprises and very high fees. Thank you, Ms. Goldstein. Professor Allen, do you agree with her that stable coins don't really show much promise as a payment system? Yes, I think that's right. I think it's also important to think about the structure of the distributed ledger. If there are problems, there's not someone you can go to if there's a problem, if it's run on a decentralized ledger with a lot of nodes managing its governance. And if, if stable coins did, in fact, hold promise to provide faster and more inclusive payments, do you think it would make sense, um, Professor Allen, to bring them into the traditional finance system? I think there are real concerns about bringing them into the traditional finance system, primarily because of their relationship with um, with DeFi. Um, there's also the issue of their run risk, of course. So, if they were to be brought, if they were to be used as payments and to be brought within the the proper financial system, we would have to be very careful about monitoring their systemic risk. And I think that's a place where the FSOC and the OFR can play an important role. Thank you. Speaking of Mr. Desparte bringing them into the financial system, last week's hearing in the House, your CEO agreed that stable coins are still mostly used for trading and speculation, but your company is currently seeking a bank charter based in what you call USDC. Just to be clear, you have an interesting name to be sure, US dollar coin is what it stands for, being a payment product. If Circle does become a bank, would you limit USDC, Mr. Desparte, to internet payments platforms? Or would you allow, still allow USDC to be used to facilitate cryptocurrency speculation? Thank you for the question, Senator. The advent of a whole host of internet native capital markets, payments, and an always on economy that is built around these innovations in public blockchains is important. It's also important that the dollar fundamentally and dollar reference stable coins ultimately win what that innovation represents. And so Circle's counterparties as a company are other institutions and, and companies. We don't face the retail market as a retail payment system. And a lot of what that is supporting ultimately are payments, crypto capital market trading, 
and, and um, other activities. And we're also seeing, I think, and this is a critical point we'd like to highlight in this hearing, we're also seeing this increasingly becoming embedded as a mechanism of payment and settlement, including amongst traditional firms. Uh, credit card companies, banks, and many others are increasingly using USDC as a settlement option on their networks, uh, which makes the medium of exchange and payment argument quite strong. So if, if, if you are regulated, if you're inside the, the if you, uh, have become if you become a bank, it it would still be used for cryptocurrency speculation. Is that a yes or a no? Well, again, USDC and the end users of USDC have no expectation of a profit. It's ultimately a medium of exchange. A dollar goes in, a dollar comes out, and we've maintained price parity to the dollar with cash and short duration Treasury, Senator, inside the care custody and control of the U.S. regulated banking system. Let 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 me ask a different way. If if Circle were a traditional finance company. It would be a financial company. It'd be a, you understand it'd be illegal for you to sell metal coins that said U.S. dollar coin on them, right? I, I, Senator, I think the question ultimately is as Circle well, that's a has a simple question. If if you were a traditional finance company, could you sell metal? You think you could sell metal coins that say U.S. dollar coin on them? No, Senator. Okay, I, that, I, that, that that's the answer. I mean, that's that's the law. Um, uh, do you think of the name of your stable coin, the U.S. dollar coin, do you think it could mislead users to believe it's backed by the U.S. government? I, I noticed you said throughout this hearing, USDC, you, you may have once at the beginning, I'm not sure you ever did, said U.S. dollar coin. I'm sure you market it that way to some who may be less sophisticated than we pretend to be up here. But um, do, do you think that's misleading in any way to call it U.S. dollar coin? No, Senator. The... The stablecoin innovation that we support is regulated consistently across the country according to electronic money and electronic money transfer and uh, statutes as a payments innovation. Uh, we're on a level playing field with companies like PayPal and other major payments companies inside the U.S. Well, okay, fair enough. Let me, let me ask a, a last question. So if the Fed moves forward with the central bank digital currency, are, are you going to let them call theirs a U.S. dollar coin or U.S. dollar? The, the, uh, that's meant with some irony, certainly. <laughs> I, I appreciate the irony. I don't know if you have a copyright or a patent on U.S. dollar coin, but I assume if there is, if we do a central bank digital currency, that they may have rights, regardless of a Supreme Court or any financial regulators, the U.S. dollar coin. But just putting that out there, last comment. Quickly, quickly, Senator, thank you for that. Um, indeed, sovereign issued currencies have three currency prefixes. So I, I'm certain one day if a central bank digital currency is issued by the Fed, they would enjoy uh, total autonomy over that name choice. They would also, I think, enjoy the experience of stable coins in circulation that all reference the dollar as important prototypes for what may one day be an opportunity in which we could upgrade this infrastructure to support a publicly issued digital currency as well. You're a good representative for USDC. Thank you, Senator. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Desparte, the, some of our witnesses today seem to think that stable coins are unlikely to ever serve any purpose other than facilitating uh, crypto speculation. Um, they've cited the cost of transactions and various things, although it seems to me this technology is moving very rapidly in the direction of facilitating and lowering the cost and increasing the volume and the throughput. Um, could you tell us what else is actually happening already with stable coins outside of the facilitation of crypto um, trading and what you think is imminent? Thank you, Senator. The, the, the blend of these types of innovations within the traditional payments and banking system I think is exactly where we are right now. That while we can, of course, acknowledge the original use case was to support crypto capital markets and a host of activities in the trading domain. What we're seeing emerging, however, is integration of stablecoin-based settlements and payments across third-generation blockchains that are increasingly better, cheaper, faster than a lot of the analog alternatives for how we move money. They increasingly also benefit from the immutable permanent ledgering of financial transactions, which have enormous gains in terms of accounting and enormous gains in, uh, gains in financial integrity. So, so, so would it be, I'm sorry to cut you off, but with, with limited time, would it be fair to say that there are large, sophisticated, traditional financial institutions that are increasingly pursuing the use of these platforms for 
as, as a, an alternative mechanism for settling payments, for instance. Indeed. And just to name a few of what would be traditional household name payments and money transmission companies and settlement networks, the Visa network has enabled USDC as a native settlement option across a network of 70 million merchants. Traditional companies in the remittance domain like MoneyGram have, have just announced a partnership with enabling USDC on the Stellar blockchain for remittances and solving for cash in and cash out across the, the world. Visa probably knows something about settling payments. Um, let me ask you, it, it seemed to be suggested that one possible alternative we might consider would be to ban stable coins. Um, if Congress banned stable coins, do you think that maybe people in other countries would develop stable coins, and then if anybody who has access to a computer and the internet, um, wouldn't, they, wouldn't they be able to access those coins? In other words, wouldn't that be very unlikely to actually work at prohibiting the use of stable coins? No question. I think it borrows then perhaps from early experiences with the advent of the internet in which people creating websites was once upon a time considered a, a precluded activity or an activity that might warrant authorization, I think the same holds true here today with how the so-called internet of value is beginning to emerge. I think it's profoundly in the American national interest and in our public interest that we have options for how people could move money in an always-on economy. Our financial needs do not take bank holidays, and our money shouldn't either. Let me move on to uh, Ms. Massari. Um, I, I think you're, uh, you've made it clear that you think that there should be a regulatory regime regarding stable coins, but, but you point out that requiring them to be insured depository institutions doesn't make a lot of sense because their fundamental purpose is different from that of insured depository institutions. Could you just briefly elaborate on that a little bit? And then I've got one last question. Sure. Happy to. Thank you for the question, uh, Senator Toomey. So I think the fundamental um, idea is that the business models and the risks raised by what I think of as well-regulated stable coins is quite different from that of traditional banks. Traditional banks take in deposits and they make long-term loans and investments with those deposit proceeds. And it's that activity, the maturity transformation and the liquidity transformation that gives rise to run risks and is sort of the core of what traditional bank regulation is designed to address. Um, this includes, for example, uh, leverage ratios designed uh, to address those core banking activities. Um, and so in my view, um, imposing uh, regulation for insured depository institutions on stable coins, which hold 100% short-term liquid reserves and are designed for payments, not lending, um, is the wrong approach. Uh, Mr. Desparte, um, as, as Congress hopefully wrestles with the question of what should an appropriate regulatory regime look like, what are some of the principles that you think we should keep in mind? Well, first, if we, you know, I would argue do no harm and allow these innovations to continue thriving inside the U.S. regulatory perimeter. Um, as a company, the state money transmission regulations have been the appropriate starting point. Um, again, if companies like PayPal and many of the other major American payments companies can exist and safely transmit trillions of dollars of transactions on their platforms under state money transmission statutes, I think that's a powerful starting point. The concept of then having bank-like risks managed in bank-like structures and supervision, I think, is similarly important. But it should be risk-adjusted, and it should be um, based on the type of activity. Technology neutrality and the type of activity should be what drives our policy. Thank you. Um, and then let me just say, um, Ms. Goldstein, I'm going to submit to you a, uh, a written question because we're out of time here. But I, but I do think that the um, examples that you provide in the case where Western Union provides a lower-cost transfer is is an unusually expensive transaction and that people who were interested in uh, a, such a transaction and were, were concerned about lowering the cost could easily construct the transaction in alternative ways that would be much lower cost. But I will submit a question for the record to clarify that. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thanks, Senator Toomey. Senator Reed is recognized from Rhode Island. For uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Professor Allen, you, I believe, invited us to uh, ask you about uh, the monetary policy aspects of the stable coin. Uh, we all understand that uh, a critical part of our economy is the ability of the Federal Reserve to control the money supply. Uh, so could you comment in whatever detail is appropriate about the impact of these stable coins on monetary policy? Thank you for the question, Senator. 
if you're dealing with a situation where there's high inflation or if you're dealing with a situation with deflation, the central, sorry, the central bank needs the ability to match the amount of money in the system to the needs of the economy. That's how monetary policy is carried out. If, however, the central bank loses control over some of the monetary supply, they lose their ability to put their hands on those levers. So this is something that central banks are extremely concerned about. And in fact, that is the impetus for a lot of interest in central bank digital currencies. Interestingly, the same central banks that are worried about these issues are also worried about the financial stability issues um, that come with the introduction of a central bank digital currency, not to mention the privacy issues. So it's an interesting question that they feel the need to compete with stable coins, perhaps more interventionist policies justified. Well, thank you very much. And one other aspect uh, is that this is a uh, novel, or at least a fairly recent phenomenon, and uh, it requires a great deal of uh, thought analysis and uh, projecting as to what we should do. And uh, after the crisis in uh, in 2008-2009, we created the Office of Financial Research. Uh, Professor Allen, do you see a role for the Office of Financial Research here in terms of analyzing, structuring, and making recommendations to Congress with respect to these stable uh, coins? Thank you, Senator. I very much do see a role for the Office of Financial Research here. The Office of Financial Research, as you know, was created to respond to the data gaps that we saw following the financial crisis of 2008. As finance has become more technologically informed, as finance sorry, faces risks from climate change and things like that, we're now needing an interdisciplinary approach to financial regulation that includes computer scientists, data scientists, climate scientists. I think the OFR right now is underutilized and could really be built up with that interdisciplinary expertise, which would give regulators a more informed foundation to engage on issues of stable coins, amongst other things. Well, thank you. I concur. Uh, uh, Ms. Goldstein, uh, there are data gaps in the cryptocurrency markets. Uh, could you highlight what you think are the most significant data gaps that we would need to have? Sure. Thank you for the question, Senator Reid. Um, unlike the stock market where we can rely on things like the consolidated audit trail or we know that all the quotes that go through every exchange are going to be reported back to a regulator at the end of the day, we're sort of um, at the mercy of what the cryptocurrency industry wants to self-report. And so we may get information about particular prices throughout the day or trades, but we may not get quote information. Um, you also will see sort of arbitrage opportunities crop up, right? The price of Bitcoin on one exchange may be different than it is on another exchange. Um, and I don't know that regulators currently have all of the data to truly understand why that might be. And so there's a real sort of... Um, I think potential for Congress to look at is there a way to make sure that we do have standardized data reporting in a way that we make sure that all the different exchanges are giving regulators all the information they need. And uh, Ms. Goldstein, I, I presume that you would have some questions about the existing uh, transparency, auditing, and disclosure requirements that are, are imposed on these entities. Is that correct? Yes, Senator, that's correct. Thank you very much. Uh, Senator uh, Brown, Chairman Brown, asked me to recognize Senator Rounds at the conclusion of my questions. Uh, Senator Rounds, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First of all, thank you to all of you for appearing before us today. As a consumer, I look at these and I say, okay, there's got to be an opportunity here. There's a reason why we have millions of people that are currently participating in, in, in these transactions using the products and services that, that you provide. At the same time, um, it seems to me that we have a regulatory responsibility to make sure that, that the illicit uses of these types of services are limited. Um, we're challenged because in the United States, as we regulate, uh, certain organizations may very well simply move outside of the United States, move elsewhere. If I'm a consumer, why would I want, and I'll, I'll direct this first of all to Mr. Desparte. If I'm a consumer, why would I want to use your service as opposed to that of a visa using dollars as the, the currency? 
Thank you, Senator, for the question. So part of what uh, Circle's innovations are providing, bearing in mind that our, our direct customer are typically businesses and we don't work with retail consumers, uh, but nonetheless, part of the infrastructure that we're supporting um, today is enjoyed by more than 20 million people in the United States and 200 million people worldwide for whom the, the price of access or the cost of access to things like international remittances, payments, money transfers, both domestic and foreign, and then candidly, access to the capital markets have been um, prohibitive, right? On the one hand, if to be banked hinges on brick and mortar infrastructure, then there will be hundreds of millions of people around the world, if not billions, who will consistently be left on the margins. So, so let, me, let, let me cut to the chase on this then. So what you're suggesting is, is that there is an economic benefit to someone because the costs of actually executing the transaction are less, I'm going to say on average, or yours, than what it would be for someone through the traditional uh, brick and mortar uh, processors. Is, is that the marketing that's being done? That, that's, part of, that's part of what the ultimate opportunity is. Um, for example, in the remittance use cases uh, of which we can describe a number, um, there's companies like Tala, which is a, a woman-founded startup that's partnered with Visa to use USDC for remittances. The proposition ultimately is that sending digital currency payments is no different than sending data. Um, of course, subject to financial crime compliance and subject to the appropriate you know, guardrails around protecting the financial system. But nonetheless, the value proposition is, is a fundamentally lower cost transfer of value on the internet. Thank you. Ms. Goldstein, I'm, I'm curious. You indicated that the cost, the actual cost per transaction was probably greater in this particular case. It seems to be a discrepancy here between your opinion on it and uh, Mr. Desparte. Can you share with us why you think it's more expensive in this particular case? Sure, Senator Rounds. I think it has to do with whether or not you are going to use the USDC coin um, to purchase other crypto? Are you going to keep it in this closed crypto ecosystem and just use it to buy something else? My point is, if you're using it for remittances, if you're sending it to another country, chances are you can't go to your local grocery store and use USDC to buy some milk. You're going to need to convert it to your local currency. There's also a fee when, say I want to send something overseas. I need to send it to somebody else's wallet. To do that, uh, the USDC coin, it, it runs on lots of blockchains, but the predominant blockchain is the Ethereum one. There's an ERC-20 token standard that they use to do that. The Ethereum network fees are incredibly high. It can cost $10. It can cost $20. I've seen it as high as $40 just to send it from my wallet to somebody else's wallet. And then once it gets to their wallet, if they're not going to use USDC to buy milk from the local grocery store, they need to convert it to the local currency. That involves putting it on an exchange. There may be a fee to trade it back to their local currency. And then they need to get it into their bank so they can pay for the milk at the grocery store. And that may also include a fee. So it has to do with, do you need to bring it back to fiat? Or can you keep it within this crypt closed crypto ecosystem? I think that's where you see the disparity. Thank you. Mr. Desparte, I'm going to give you a chance to respond. What's your analysis of what you just Yeah, said? so so thank you for, for, for the opportunity, Senator. The quick version of this is early blockchains are a little bit akin to dial-up internet. And the argument to ban the stablecoin innovation because the current experience on certain early blockchains may be a little slower, a little cost prohibitive, um, ignores the fact that the innovation isn't standing still. They're late generation blockchains, third generation blockchains that are approaching transaction throughput akin to major credit card networks and approaching cost structures on pennies on the dollar for, for value transfer. Thank you. My time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Senator Rounds. On behalf of Chairman Brown, let me recognize Senator Danes. Senator Reid, thank you. Um, Stablecoin policy It's an area where I think there should be, and hopefully there will be, broad bipartisan agreement as well as compromise. Stablecoins are distinct from cryptocurrency in that there is a central entity that issues and is responsible for any individual token. Personally, I believe that we should pursue a lighter touch approach to regulating the innovation taking place with cryptocurrencies and with stable coins, but I do believe a bipartisan legislative framework that I hope this committee would agree on is both possible for stable coins and frankly necessary. I'd urge my colleagues to avoid hyper-partisan solutions and instead seek consensus 
on something that's truly bipartisan, that will provide certainty needed for the private industry to grow as well as to prosper. This, I believe, will help provide the best pathway forward for this technology to grow in a way that will benefit Montanans, the American people, as well as the global financial system. Mr. Desparte, can you describe the current regulatory environment facing stablecoin users such as Circle? Thank you for the question, Senator Daines. And we, we agree with the spirit of appealing to a nonpartisan approach to how to regulate these innovations inside the United States. Arguably, when I look at the experience of a company like Circle, we are licensed from sea to shining sea under state money transmission regulations and answerable through the examination process to um, the bank supervisors and the state money transmission supervisors across the country. We've also, as a company, helped contribute to um, creating a model law to try to make a more uniform operating environment. We're also a registered money transmission company with FinCEN and have worked um, over the years with law enforcement and other actors on, on protecting the integrity of the financial system, which is an important pillar. Um, when you think about this innovation outside of the United States, however, and what it means to compete on a global environment, this is where I think the U.S. faces a gap. At the Bank for International Settlements, at the Financial Action Task Force, the Financial Stability Board, state regulators are not represented. It's the federal and national regulators that are. And I think that's where the U.S. potentially faces a competitiveness gap at the moment. But broadly speaking, I think our current regimes for money transmission provide for a degree of sufficiency around the use of, of an electronic form of payments and a medium of exchange like a stablecoin. Thank you. You, um, you touched on the issue, certainly on the global um, situation, and that really leads me to the question I have for uh, Ms. Masari. Can you describe how a U.S. depegged stablecoin could advance the role of the U.S. dollar from an international viewpoint and how that might help preserve the dollar status is the world's foremost reserve currency. Thank you for the question, Senator. Um, to me, this is a very interesting uh, line of thinking about how stablecoins could affect monetary policy. To me, it's not entirely clear that they would be harmful to monetary policy where regulated um, uh, in the manner that I described in my testimony back to 100%, um, at least 100% by uh, bank deposits, U.S. Treasuries. Um, uh, as some of my uh, fellow witnesses have spoke about, you know, these uh, stablecoins can be available for remittance transfers for use outside the United States, just as other dollar-type uh, accounts and payment instruments. Um, and to my mind, just as those instruments help to bolster the standing of the U.S. dollar as a world's reserve currency, um, the argument should be the same for stablecoins. So... Um what do you think the future of stablecoin regulation would be if Congress doesn't act in a bipartisan fashion to foster safe and stable growth? It's a great question, Senator. Thank you. Um, my own view is that it would be um, useful for Congress to think about a federal charter, an optional federal charter for stablecoin issuers um, I think this is uh, a really important aspect of ensuring appropriate regulation at the federal level um, uh, to achieve all of the policy goals that I think we care about um, in a nonpartisan and bipartisan way. Um, to my mind, the state regulatory uh, regime that exists today has gone a long way to uh, serve the interests of consumers in different states. I think a federal framework would provide additional clarity if it's available. Speaking of benefits, perhaps, um, back to Ms. Desparte, uh, what are some of the ways in which stable coins lower costs within and increase access to the financial systems? Indeed. Um, thank you for the question, Senator. On, on the one front, I get back to the question of if to be banked hinges on traditional brick-and-mortar infrastructure, then many, many people will be unbanked or underbanked. And we saw that happening with the advent of the COVID-19 pandemic and the inability to move money at scale across the Internet was a vulnerability for the country and the world. Stable coins begin to solve for that by having a trusted medium of exchange that are dollar referenced on the Internet itself, and that allows for lower cost transactions. It allows for a whole host of other financial services to blossom where the fundamental trust in the dollar is protected and preserved. Senator Reid. Oh, Mr. Chairman Brown. Thank you, Senator Daines. All right. I just voted quickly. Uh, the senior senator from Montana is recognized. 
Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you, the ranking member, for having this meeting, uh, this hearing, and I want to thank everybody for testifying. Um, so I've heard, uh, I've heard from uh, a lot of folks in the cryptocurrency space. Uh, their descriptions of their product reminds me uh, of something, um, and it's it's not necessarily a good thing. Uh, it reminds me of the synthetic products that we saw leading up to the financial crisis of 08. Um, because, not in all cases, but uh, in some, there isn't anything real behind them. Now, I know stablecoin is backed by real assets, but that doesn't mean they can't be manipulated, and it doesn't mean when you combine all these products together that there is an opportunity for some, uh, some foul play, let's put it that way. Uh, so for you, Professor Allen, um, do you think that's a fair comparison that I just made between cryptocurrency and synthetic financial instruments? Yes, I do. And thank you for that analogy, Senator. When we t heard about the synthetic products in the lead up to the financial crisis of 2008, we heard things like these will promote home ownership. Um, and so you have to be wary, I think, of claims of financial inclusion because sometimes they're overblown. And you particularly have to be wary of them in circumstances where the means to providing that goal is unnecessary com unnecessarily complex. Complexity is a problem for financial stability. You don't understand why things are the way they are. If they're too complicated, that primes the system for confusion, opacity, and then panics. So when we have a product like the stablecoin that's being proposed to solve financial inclusion, we have to ask ourselves, why does it need to be so complex? Why does it need to run on a distributed ledger with um, decentralized governance mechanisms? That, and you know, why do we need the environmental costs of that kind of process? Are there not innovations that are simpler that could achieve the goal in a simpler way? Um, Ms. Goldstein, do you have anything you'd like to add to that? Um. <clears throat> Senator, I would just add that I agree. I mean, I worked on Wall Street before, during, and after the financial crisis, and I do think that there are some important comparisons to the products that you raise. I do think that the secondary market where stablecoins participate, DeFi in particular, in some ways reminds me of the over-the-counter derivatives markets, but that was aimed at institutions. DeFi is very much retail and institutions. Uh, Professor Allen, I want to go back to you for a second. Uh, I believe you were the one that stated that if you have problems, there's no one to go to. Is that, that Was that correct? That would have been your opening statement. Yes, that's correct. So so I've got to ask you, if, if I had a problem, if I was using, um, using these uh, uh, products, um, who would I go to? Or am I just, well, it depends. Am I just out in the cold? Thank you, Senator. I think it depends. Um, if, in fact, the stablecoin has an issuer behind it that manages the reserve and there's a problem, you could go to that stablecoin issuer. But then that sort of uh, highlights that these things are not as decentralized as anticipated. We're hitting new intermediaries coming into the system. Um, and those intermediaries have profit motives like any established financial intermediary. And so the, the sense of democratizing finance, I think, falls apart. If we're talking about a stablecoin that's being operated in a truly decentralized fashion, where it's operating on a ledger where you need multiple nodes to agree to any change um, in how the ledger operates, then that is something that could um, cause incredible problems. I mean, who would you go to? Who, which of those people would you be able to reach out to if you needed a transaction undone, for example, because there was a mistake made? Um, all right, thank you. Uh, Ms. Ms. Goldstein, you, you talked about uh, that these, uh, they have to meet four objectives. One of them was fees. What were the other three? Um, it needs to be predictable. You need to be able to exchange it for goods and services. Um, and you mentioned fees. Uh, I forget what the That's okay. <laughs> That's all right. Forget my fourth. It does it, <clears throat> it, it, you said it doesn't meet fees because fees are high. Correct. It, does it meet the other three? I think when you stay within the cryptocurrency ecosystem, it does meet the speed requirement. I don't think it meets the predictability uh, requirement, and I don't think it meets the exchanging it for goods and services requirement broadly. Very quickly, because my time is slim, what kind of fees are we talking about compared to what we see in the industry today? 
It depends on the exchange. It depends if you're moving back to fiat. But let's say you start at fiat, you move into stable coins, you buy one on an, by buying one on an exchange, right? Because as Mr. Desparte, Desparte said, they don't service retail customers. You got to go to an exchange. You send it to someone else. They put it on an exchange. You bring it back to fiat. It can be as high as eighty dollars front to back, or as low as six dollars. Western Union's about four or five. Okay, and what kind of amount? That's a flat fee. Regardless it's, of how much money you're It's paying. an accumulation of fees because you have to take several steps gotcha. throughout the whole Thank ecosystem. you very much. Thank you all. Uh, thank you, Senator Chester. Uh, S Senator uh, Warner from Virginia is on from his office. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, I appreciate you holding this hearing. And um, I, I'm very concerned. I, I agree with the ranking member that there's a lot of innovation going on and we shouldn't um, get rid of that. I do am, am very concerned sitting from the Intel standpoint uh, that a lot of this is being used for illegal and illicit purposes. Um, we just had a major break into our uh, state legislative system in Virginia. Everything is frozen. A ransomware effort has been, has been, uh, uh, threat has been issued. And my fear is um, it will be paid off in, in some level of Bitcoin and potentially using a stable coin as uh, the ability to transfer it back to a, to a fiat currency, but let me ask the question that, that, um, and I'll start with Ms. Goldstein, but I'd probably would take everybody. I think I understand some on distributed ledger and DeFi and the notion of, of creating a different um, uh, currency. I mean, gold has no inherent value. So the idea if we as a society may pick Bitcoin or some other uh, entity to have a value I'm, has some logic to me, but the idea of a, private sector stablecoin, where you have a literally dollar for dollar or totally liquid security and no leverage at all, how do you make any money off this? I get it if you are Facebook and you're, you've got a whole network effect and you become the default uh, crypto wallet, and that means you're collecting a whole lot more information. But Ms. Goldstein, I'll start with you. I get it now if, if they are making all these fees, but if uh, Mr. Des Desparte is right and they're going to ultimately get down to a frictionless transaction, how do you make enough money just off the float to have this kind of stable coin become a, uh, a viable financial investment? I mean, Senator, I think that's a good question. I think that's why you see, for example, um, Circle in some of their SEC filings have said they want to move potentially into Circle DeFi and offer additional services that allow, you know, customers to access DeFi platforms like Aave and Compound with APIs that Circle talks in their investor presentation about about building. I also think, you know, they have a revenue sharing agreement with with Coinbase. Um, perhaps they're making some profits from um, from Coinbase. I mean, I would direct the question to Mr. Desparte. But I imagine that it's not if it's just treasuries and it's just cash. I think I understand why I see in the SEC investor materials that they do want to provide other services like Circle DeFi in the future. I, I'm going to get to Mr. Desparte, but I'd like to hear from Ms. Masari first. Because, again, I'm, help me out here. We're a big name firm. Um, they got to be paying folks a lot of fees. If you've literally got no leverage at all and you've got a one for one exchange and you're going to bring down the transaction cost. How do you, and, and you don't have a network effect the way Facebook would from Libra or Diem or whatever they're calling it this week, how do you make any money? Thank you, Senator. It's a great question. Um, and of course, I can't speak about uh, any of my clients or particular projects, but um, I think your observation is right. If we appropriately regulate uh, stablecoin issuers, um, they should only be holding short-term liquid assets to back their stablecoin obligations. Um, that likely isn't the main source um, of revenues for them. Um, and they can provide uh, payment services and other services uh, adjacent to the issuance of the stable coin. Um, you know, the same kinds of payment services that I think we see today, whether it's remittances um, or peer-to-peer -peer transfers or other kinds of services um, and perhaps uh, charge fees for those services. But isn't, again, and I'm going to get to Mr. Desparte, but it's just, you know, these other pay PayPal, I don't believe argues that it literally has a dollar backing every dollar that goes through the PayPal transaction system. I'm going to let Ms. Allen answer as well, but I want to hear, Mr. Desparte, how, how are you going to make any money if we get to this frictionless system you claim you're headed towards? Uh, thank you for the question, Senator. And for just a general matter, as a company, we're in the process of going public, so there's quite a lot of customer and market-facing disclosure 
around the business's revenue model, but akin to a PayPal, PayPal holds an omnibus account that is held in the interest of customers to execute transactions. So we have a very similar business model and a very similar US licensing platform. Um, and, and our current reserve structure is cash and short-term treasuries of 90 days or less. So there is a nominal degree of interest rate sensitivity on that reserve composition. That is part of our revenue model. There's also a revenue model implied um, in terms of de minimis transaction fees uh, for using Circle accounts and other services. We also Let's, operate- Let me get to Miss, let me get, my time's running out. Let me get to Miss Allen. I, I mean, again, Stablecoins brags about the fact that you got a dollar for dollar exchange. Um, Miss Allen, my time's up, but if you want to add any comment, I'll, I appreciate it. I'll just say very briefly, no one's going to offer this service if there isn't a way for them to make money. If we're trying to promote financial inclusion, we want it to be a win-win, but there's reason to be skeptical when the actual money-making um, nature of the innovation isn't fully disclosed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Senator Warren. Warner. Uh, Senator Warren from Massachusetts is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So unlike other cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, stable coins like Tether and USDC are supposedly pegged to the dollar. And the reason for this is to reassure people that stable coins are as stable as using the dollars you have in your wallet or in your checking account. A stable coin dollar, in other words, will supposedly be worth a real dollar. Now, that would make it a lot easier and a lot safer to trade among different tokens to put up collateral for a risky bet or even to pay for a cup of coffee at your local bodega. But I want to examine whether or not the stablecoin talk matches the stablecoin reality. Ms. Goldstein, let's say that I own $10 worth of Tether or USDC. If I want to trade my $10 worth of these tokens, am I guaranteed to get $10 back? Uh, no, Senator. You're sort of dependent on the exchange where you're trading it. Because as a U.S. retail customer, I cannot go to Circle and say, please redeem my USDC. And Tether explicitly says no U.S. customer can redeem Tether. So I have to trade it on an exchange. Sometimes it fluctuates. Sometimes it's a little above the dollar. Sometimes it's a little below. But if there were a run, the peg could collapse. Um, and we also don't really know necessarily what's backing all of these stable coins, right? Tether well, is. Hold on a sec. I want to get into that. Okay, I, I promise. Uh, because I, I want to just underscore this point, that if Tether's tokens were actually backed one-to-one, -one, it would be one of the 50 largest banks in the country. But we know that it is not. And that's because, according to Tether's own report, only about 10% of the assets backing its stablecoin are real dollars in the bank. 90% is something else, not real dollars. And if that worries you, there's a little more news on this one. The report that 10% of Tether's stable coins are backed up by dollars is not actually verified by a comprehensive audited financial statement or verified by any government regulator. So, Professor Allen, let me ask you, let's say I'm not the only one who wants to redeem my $10 worth of Tether or USDC for dollars, and maybe there's bad news in the market and people rush to cash in their stable coins. What would a run on the stable coin market look like? Could it endanger our financial system? Thank you for that question, Senator. Uh, so a number of the witnesses today have said that stable coins don't engage in maturity transformation and therefore don't um, suffer the same fragilities as bank deposits and runs. And that's probably true to some degree. But a run on a stable coin would look a lot like the runs that we've seen on money market mutual funds in 2008 and again in 2020. And it could also share dynamics with the foreign exchange crisis we've seen in the past, like the Mexican peso crisis. So if holders of a stable coin suddenly lose confidence in either the ability of the issuer of the stable coin or the reserve of assets backing it to maintain a stable value, they could seek to redeem or exchange their stable coin en masse. And if they have direct redemption rights, that would force the issuer to liquidate its reserve of assets. So right now, I don't think that would have systemic consequences. If stable coin holders are only using them to speculate, they're not really going to expect stability. And so runs will be less likely. 
But if a run did occur right now, I think the impact would probably be felt in the DeFi ecosystem. And that's why it's critical that we not provide this government support to the DeFi ecosystem. Okay, and so, expect to so let out. me go there. Sorry to interrupt, but let me go there. We know that stable coins are not always stable. In fact, it's worse than that. In troubled economic times, people are most likely to cash out of risky financial products and move into real dollars. Stable coins will take a nosedive precisely when people most need stability. And that run on the bank mentality could ultimately crash our whole economy. But there's another piece of the risk here, and you've headed in that direction, Professor Allen. DeFi is the most dangerous part of the crypto world. This is where the regulation is effectively absent, and no surprise, it's where the scammers and the cheats and the swindlers mix among part-time investors and first-time crypto traders. Shoot, in DeFi, someone can't even tell if they're dealing with a terrorist. Stable coins provide the lifeblood of the DeFi ecosystem. In DeFi, people need stable coins to trade between different coins, to trade derivatives, to lend and borrow money, all outside the regulated banking system. Without stable coins, DeFi comes to a halt. So, Professor Allen, does DeFi threaten our financial stability, and can DeFi continue to grow without stable coins? I don't think DeFi can grow without stable coins. I think it would struggle. Right now, I think DeFi is contained to the point where it won't impact financial stability. But if it grows, I think there's a real threat there, particularly if it becomes intertwined with our traditional financial system. And there is industry interest in pursuing this integration on both the traditional finance and the crypto side. So I think it's critical that stable coins not be allowed to fuel that growth. Well, I appreciate it. You know, this is risk to traders, risk to our economy. The time to act is before it all blows up. Stablecoins have no regulators, no independent auditors, no guarantors, nothing. And they are propping up one of the shadiest parts of the crypto world, the place where consumers are least protected from getting scammed. Our regulators need to get serious about clamping down on these risks before it is too late. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Senator Warren. Uh, Senator Smith from Minnesota is recognized. Uh, thank you, Chair Brown, and thank you to our panelists for being here today. Um, I want to ask about um, this. So as businesses uh, transition to cashless models, some businesses could adopt stablecoin or even crypto as an alternative or as the only method for a payment. Um, and I'm trying to figure out what impact that this could have on people, especially people of color, who are so often left out of the financial system. According to a report by the FDIC, approximately 7.1 million households are unbanked. That was in 2019. And so as we move to a cashless economy, what happens to people who are low income or homeless or undocumented, and how do they pay for things that they would need in a stable coins world? Does stable coins actually give them more freedom um, and access, or does it become another barrier? So um, Ms. Goldstein and Professor, um, Professor Allen, could you help me answer this question? Advocates for stablecoin argue that they provide access for small businesses and unbanked people. Um, what do you think about that argument, and how exactly does stablecoin work for someone who doesn't have a checking or a savings account? Um, if I may briefly and then give Professor Allen a chance to respond. Um, again, because stablecoins aren't widely accepted for goods and services, you need a bank. And not only do you need a bank, you need an account at a cryptocurrency exchange in order to buy stablecoins in the first place, at least the top two ones. And so I think this is why we saw the World Economic Forum find that there are not many financial inclusion benefits to stablecoins, because it's essentially using the rails of the existing banking system. So until, you know, and if, I think it's a big if, we see mass adoption of stablecoins as a way to accept things at the grocery store to buy, buy your, your groceries, um, I don't really see how this helps the unbanked, because you need a bank and you need a cryptocurrency exchange. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, Professor Allen. So I agree with Ms. Goldstein's comments. Um, I just want to add something further, which is financial literacy is already a huge problem for a lot of people. We expect a lot of consumers in terms of their ability to read complex financial documents and understand them. With the move to crypto-related financial services, we're asking them as well often to understand computer code because disclosures don't always match the computer code. And so investors in these um, areas 
tend to go to the code themselves. So I think that is just entirely unreasonable to expect people to be able to sense the risks in these type of products on their own by looking at the code. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's difficult enough for, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's extremely difficult for anybody to understand. So I, I really agree with you. Let me ask you another question about this. Um, we, of course, need to make sure that workers can rely on their pensions, the pensions that they have earned. This is something that Chair Brown and I have worked on, um, focused on since I first came to the Senate. So as stable coins and cryptocurrencies become more prominent in the financial system, it seems like it's worth looking at what this could mean for retirement plan assets and figuring out whether it's a good idea for them to be offered as investment options for pension plans or 401k plans. So, um, Professor Allen, let me um, stay with you. For workers or teachers who are thinking about their retirement accounts or pensions, what do you think is the right role or is there a role for stable coins in those plans? I don't think that there is a role for them there. Um, I appreciate that people are going through a really hard time right now. The search for yield in this environment, you know, is a very real pressure, but uh, I feel it's very dangerous for people to gravitate towards highly volatile um, assets in that search for yield. And particularly when we're talking about long-term investments like retirement, I think that's a recipe for disaster. Ms. Goldstein, would you like to comment on that? Uh, yes, yeah, so I'll, I'll just add that I agree with Professor Allen. I, I don't really know that there's a retirement, you know, uh, investor that wants the volatility and in, and insol solvency risk of Bitcoin, but gives you uh, no, you know, very little yield, if any at all. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So we know that the stablecoin market is worth about $130 billion, and a lot of this growth has happened really fast in the last couple of years. And I personally don't think that regulators have kept up with this transition. Uh, the President's Working Group on Financial Markets recently released a report on stablecoins with suggestions for Congress, as well as banking regulatory agencies, on recommendations for what we should think about as we regulate stablecoin. Um, I just have a couple seconds left, but um, what, Ms. Goldstein, I'll, I'll stay with you. Um, what do you think we should be considering as policymakers as we think about a regulatory framework for stablecoins? Um, Senator Smith, I think we need to think about the secondary market and how stable coins drive DeFi and make sure that there isn't a gap between the protections that you receive as an investor in the equity markets and the protections that you may receive as an investor in the crypto asset markets, whether it's best execution or making sure that the trades aren't manipulated or being spoofed, wash tradings, you name it. I think we need to make sure that we are narrowing that gap as much as possible so that we can all enjoy the protections that we're used to seeing um, in the equity markets. Thank you so much. I know I'm out of time, so I'll um, yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Smith. Uh, Senator Sinema from Arizona is recognized um, from her office. Um, I believe she is still getting on. She may be on the floor voting, but I, I would like to hold for a moment. And if I, I will ask one question, if Senator Chumi wants to ask one too, um, Ms. Goldstein, is it is it true that uh, dis, that cryptocurrency speculation on decentralized finance platforms wouldn't work without stable coins? Uh, yes, Senator. I think that's that's right. Or at least they would be a lot smaller. So could a company like Circle create a stable coin that can be used for electronic payments but couldn't be used to gamble on cryptocurrencies like Doja coins? Uh, yes, Chairman, I think, I think you could. You could design the system however you'd like, and there's nothing. Yes, they absolutely could do that. So, Professor Allen, what, what are the risks of allowing stable coins to be used both as a payment system and as a tool to allow gambling in DeFi markets? In terms of be allowing them to be used as a payment system, I think the biggest financial stability risk is if that is offered by a, a tech company like Meta, Facebook, or Amazon, because then you have uh, the potential for these to scale up really quickly to be used for um, everyday goods and services, and then we do potentially have both monetary policy and financial stability issues in the sense that the tech company would become too big to fail and essentially part of the government safety net. Unless um, one of those tech companies moves into this space, though, I don't see stablecoins becoming used for everyday goods and service payments 
absent some kind of government support in the form of deposit insurance or the equivalent. So if that does happen, these could then um, be used potentially for payments, um, but also they would be uh, used to a large extent in the DeFi ecosystem. And that is essentially, in my view, going to be shadow banking 2.0 um, in terms of the government essentially having to bail out in this entirely um, self-referential financial system that operates outside the boundaries of what we normally regulate. Um, thank you, Professor Allen. So, uh, Mr. Uh, Disparte, since you're, the name of your company was invoked during this little discussion, uh, when testifying in front of Congress, Circle, on the, on the President's Working Group, Circle emphasized it's a payment platform that can help small businesses or enable cheap international payments, a concern also uh, about which Senator uh, Warner from Virginia was concerned, as you heard. But on your website, Circle highlights the DeFi protocols it's designed to work with, and your CEO recently bragged on Twitter that your U.S. dollar coin is the most used stable coin for making bets in these unregulated markets. So, uh, Mr. Disparti, if, if Circle's a safe, stable banking product to facilitate payments to small business businesses, why is your company also promoting its use to gamble on cryptocurrencies? How does that actually help small businesses or the economy? There, Senator, thank you for the question. There is, of course, a wide range of use cases for any payment infrastructure, any payment innovation in the software intermediated capital markets, also known as DeFi. Um, the use of stable coins is an important innovation, but its fundamental function is exactly the same. And the expectation of the end user is that they only get a dollar out uh, from the economic uh, use of a stable coin for any of these activities. Thank you. Uh, Senator Toomey, and then, then we'll, um, after Senator Toomey, we'll call on Senator, uh, on Senator Sinema if she's on, and otherwise I think we'll likely adjourn. So go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Ms. Massari, uh, I've had a little back and forth with the SEC chairman. Uh, Mr. Gensler has, I think, at times indicated that um, stable coins, at least some stable coins, may actually be securities, even if they lack an inherent expectation of profits. Um, but he hasn't explained to me exactly what the criteria he's using, what legal tests, what makes a stable coin that has no expectation of profit a security. And it seems to me that some expectation of a gain on the part of an investor is a fundamental, um, is fundamentally at the heart of what we consider to be security. So I want to ask you, if, if there's a non-interest-bearing stable coins, and most are not in, intrinsically bearing interest, and there's no explicit expectation of profits, and really the value proposition is there's a utility that, that is the reason people are interested in the stable coin. But in such an example, do you think that it meets our definition of what is a security and should be regulated as a security? Senator Toomey, thank you for the question. As you might imagine, every practitioner in this area is extremely well-versed in the Howey test and the Reeves test, and I won't uh, bore you with the technical details, but in short, in my view, um, a non-interest-bearing stablecoin fully reserved and regulated as many uh, stablecoin issuers are today as money transmitters, um, those stablecoins should not be viewed as securities. They're appropriately not viewed as securities under existing law. Thank you. And um, Mr. Desparte, um, I was wondering if you could give us, uh, you made a, a really interesting and I think important observation about how rapidly um, this space is evolving, how the capabilities are expanding, how speed and throughput are accelerating, and you made the analogy to uh, back when the internet relied on dial-up modems, it's a little bit faster today. Um, and I suspect that the uh, capabilities of these platforms to handle large volumes of transaction is also going to grow. And as it does, it seems to me there's um, very interesting potential for smart contracts. Could you give us an idea of uh, how we should think about smart contracts and maybe even an example of uh, a smart contract that would have um, a, a, a use case for an ordinary small business or consumer? Absolutely. Thank you for the question, Senator. Indeed, I would argue that the public infrastructure and this open source technology wave that is happening, what many are likening to a Web 3, where Web 1 was read, Web 2 was read and write, and Web 3 is read, write, own, 
is an, an important innovation and has a lot of implications broadly for financial resilience and, and competitiveness. An example of a smart contract innovation could be something really important and close to home for me coming from the insurance world, for example. One of the most elusive aspects of the insurance world is this concept of a parametric claim, a, a homeowner's policy that could liquidate a claim based on a geo-reference where the disaster took place and there's no equivocation that it in fact was a total loss would be a game changer. The absence of being able to do that at scale and quickly and in real time is partly solved for by a trusted dollar digital currency like USDC, but also partly solved for what the capability is of a smart contract. So you've started to see some blockchain-based innovations taking place in that domain, in the insurance domain, but, but an open internet dollar functionally becomes one of the only missing links to, to enable that at scale. Um, other examples you know, are opportunities around uh, zero default loans. Effectively, programmable money enables you to execute even micropayments where by today's standards, sending even small amounts of money, it often costs more than the sum of money sent. And so the ability to execute micropayments, I use an example in my written testimony about a journalist being able to accrue a penny for every like. By today's payment standards, it's not possible to execute that penny to the journalist, so the freelancer is effectively a starving artist or a starving writer or a starving journalist. And then there's a whole host of other use cases that are enabled by this. Um, Cross-border payments, being able to have sanctions compliant money movement, for example. Corruption, bribery, and fraud, and fraud internationally in, in a humanitarian context, money is the, is the honeypot, especially physical money because of its opacity. Stablecoin-based payments and blockchain-based payments because of their transparency, their speed, and their auditability can enable a whole host of applications. Uh, USDC was used, for example, to support doctors in Venezuela um, as one use case of moving humanitarian funds uh, using, using these innovations. So I think we're in the opening innings. And when people say we have failed the financial inclusion test, the presumption is the stablecoin has agency just as the dollar, and both are patently wrong. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Toomey. Senator Sinema is recognized uh, from her office. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to Senator Toomey in particular for extending the questions so I was able to join today. I also want to thank our witnesses for being here today. As you know, Mr. Chairman, I co-chaired the Senate's Financial Innovation Caucus alongside my friend, Senator Lummis of Wyoming. So I'm glad that we're holding this hearing on stablecoins today. As you know, stablecoins are cryptocurrencies that are pegged to other external reference assets like a fiat currency, another virtual currency, a commodity, or a combination of these assets. As more Americans choose to invest in, hold, and transact with digital assets, it's important for policymakers to consider the regulatory implications of this trend and the innovations happening in this ecosystem. Ms. Masari, it's great to meet you and to discuss this important topic. If an Arizonan is looking at holding a stable coin, how can he or she know for sure that it's truly backed by the asset that the issuer claims? Thank you uh, for the question, Senator, Senator Sinema. So today in the United States, stablecoin issuers, U.S. stablecoin issuers are regulated uh, by the states in which they uh, offer their services and where they're located. Uh, this is regulation under state money transmission licensing regimes, um, uh, which uh, exist in every state but one. Uh, in addition, uh, they're regulated for financial crimes purposes by FinCEN, a bureau of the U.S. Treasury Department, as, as money services businesses. Um, that being said, it's primarily the state regulators that are responsible for uh, oversight and supervision uh, of money transmitters, including stablecoin issuers. So we would look to those state regulators um, to ensure that the stablecoin issuers, like other payment service providers and stored value providers, are living up to their promises. Thank you. And as I understand it, currently, stablecoin issuers are generally subject to state-level money transmitter laws. Do these state laws require a particular standardized way of disclosing how the stablecoin is backed? It's a great uh, question, Senator. So these uh, laws generally require uh, stablecoin issuers, like other payment providers and stored value providers, to maintain what are called eligible assets to back their obligations to customers. Um, they are also required to provide financial reports to their regulators, and of course, any disclosures that they make about how they hold assets uh, must be accurate. I see. Now, in the event that stablecoin isn't truly backed, is there a risk that the Arizona could try and redeem their token for cash and the issuer may not be able to provide it? Now, that's a problem for the Arizona in the near term, but what bigger problems could that cause in the long term? 
It's a great question, Senator. I think the short answer is yes. That could certainly be a problem. Um, that's one reason why I support common sense, strong regulation of stablecoin issuers. Um, as I mentioned, the states are currently largely responsible for that regulation. In my view, a federal option uh, could also be explored to uh, achieve the same goals. Thank you. Now, Ms. Masari, the Arizona holds $10,000 in a particular stable co coin, and then there's a run on the issuer. How much of the $10,000 could the Arizona lose if the backing on the coin isn't credible? That's a great question again, and I think these are um, really important questions to think about as we think about how to reg regulate stable coins. Um, unfortunately, I'm going to give you a lawyerly uh, uh, answer, which is it depends. It depends on the assets that are available uh, in bankruptcy to redeem out uh, the stablecoin holders if the, if the stablecoin issuer goes into bankruptcy. I mean, in general, how much money is left uh, with a stablecoin holder that's available for the stablecoin holders uh, to get uh, in that kind of situation. Thank you. You know, this is an important issue for which consumers and investors deserve a clear answer. At the same time, though, we should not assume that simply overlaying every law and regulation we have for other issuers or depository institutions is automatically the correct issue here. Now, in the short time we have left, I'd love to hear from Ms. Masari and Ms. Goldstein on my last question. Relatives to banks or other issuers of digital currency, can you highlight the key differences, good and bad, the policymaker should continue when thinking about regulation of stablecoin issuers? So first, Ms. Masari. Again, thank you for the question. Um, to my mind, when thinking about stablecoin regulation, this regulation is really important. It's really important to protect consumers. It's really important to protect our financial system. But at its core, the most important thing is to make sure that the regulation fits the activity. Right? The stablecoin stable coin issuance is different from traditional banking, and therefore, in my view, it doesn't make sense to overlay the same regulations that we have for traditional banks um, uh, on top of stablecoin stable issuers. Uh, and Senator, I'll just add very quickly that I think um, that stablecoin issuers in particular, when they go to raise funds or they're going to issue new tokens, we sort of have this uneven playing field. There are looser standards for fundraising for crypto tokens, including stable coins, than say, for a pharmaceutical company going to the public markets and raising money. And that's sort of like having a triathlon where you're asking, say, 10% of the participants, they get to skip the swim, right? And so I don't think that we should be- I would like to do that personally, just to <laughs> Yeah, no, I think it will be a good trick, right? Um, <laughs> So I don't think we should be advantaging one industry over another when it comes to fundraising from the public markets. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member for extending the hearing. I really appreciate the time today, and I thank our witnesses for appearing. Uh, thank you, Senator Sinema. Uh, this has been, and Senator Kramer is not on. Uh, thank you. This has been an important and eye-opening discussion. In the past, this committee and financial regulators have failed to pay attention to these issues. Uh, until it's too late, they've devastated workers and families, and too many cases have been devastated in this country. And the ranking member state, my state, all over the country will continue to keep a close eye on stable coins and cryptocurrencies well, to ensure that this economic recovery that we've worked so hard to build is not destroyed by another crisis. Uh, thank you to the four witnesses today. For senators who wish to submit questions, for the record, these questions are due one week from today, Tuesday, December 21st. Witnesses will have 40 to five days to respond to any questions. Thank you again to the four of you. Committee's adjourned.